Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, say hello and to welcome everyone. And most importantly, to welcome a very special person in my life. Uh, this is Mrs. Walter Schering. Uh, we have known each other for decades by now, and uh, I am a very proud uh, laureate of Henning Schering Award in 1994, which was given to me by the Schering Foundation, led by Mrs. Schering. It basically started my career, and ever since we have been uh, extremely close uh, on many, many levels. And uh, the the involvement of Mrs. Sharing in my life personally uh, simply cannot be overestimated. But today we're talking about Henry Sharing. Uh, we are remembering a great artist, a great uh, person. Uh, humanitarian, someone who has influenced an enormous amount of lives. And uh, we all know his artistry, we know his recordings. Some of us are still fortunate enough to have attended his concerts. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot count myself among them. Uh, but there are uh, certain sides of his life uh, that are not known to general public. And I would like to ask Mrs. Sharing maybe to share some of it with us, please. With pleasure. Um, everybody knows that Henrik Schering, or most probably everybody knows that Henrik Schering put a great point in helping others who were in need, charity all over the world, and during all his life, started at, as a young artist, even shortly before the outbreak of World War II. He did this even when he himself uh, had to turn around each and every penny because his income was meager, especially after he emigrated from uh, Europe to South America in the beginning 1943. So in order to improve his meager income, he played the violin not on stage, but in publicity spots, such as for Coca-Cola, for instance, or he doubled uh, in movies uh, the actors who played the violin. So he doubled them, especially in the movie Letters from a Stranger, based on the novel by Stefan Zweig, or in The White Nights of St. Petersburg, by based on Tolstoy's novel Kreuzer Sonata. And uh, when he couldn't earn some extra money through violin playing, he played the piano. And that was during his years in Mexico. So he could be found around midnight in one of the most fashionable hotels in Mexico City, sitting at the piano and playing Gershwin, Cole Porter, swing, blues, rumba, samba, what have you. And uh, the money he earned through this, he immediately shared it afterwards during a sumptuous dinner with if possible, a beautiful young lady, and then he found himself empty pocket again. But he didn't care. For him, it was just the joy of the moment to share something. He helped, of course, mostly through his concert activities. And uh, outstanding is one of the concert he gave in Canada uh, in well, it was in the 1940s also. And uh, he played for the Canadian Army with a brass band. And he played Bach and Paganini. It was a big success, and the uh, conductor was very happy, of course. And he asked, well, uh, Mr. Schering, can't you come back? And he said, of course I can. 
could you possibly play the Beethoven concerto? And he said, of course I can, let's fix a date. And uh, next to him was Gilles Lefebvre. At this, uh, he was the president of the Canadian Arts Council and he had initiated this concert. And he said, oh my goodness. So he had to rearrange the music according to a brass band. And he said, he reminiscent on this and he said, I remember how heavy our transcription of the second movement was. <laughs> and I sh shall never forget the ghastly effect of the wood players responding to the soloist's song. So that was a special concert, I think, which nobody, nobody knows of, probably. Um, charity for him was also helping uh, artists, young violinists. Um, more than once he offered a violin to a young violinist who needed a better instrument than or he deserved a better instrument than the one he had or she had, like uh, Shlomo Minz, for example. I also witnessed him taking out of his case uh, twice an extremely valuable percut bow and handing it over as a spontaneous gift to an orchestra leader once in Israel and once in Zagreb. A long list of violins out of his possession also went to orchestras, conservatories, music schools, and so on and so on. And his famous Stradivari Hercules is still singing in Tel Aviv, Israel, and his Andrea Guarnerius in Mexico. So this is a side of Henrik Schering, which is partly known, partly less known. He himself, he was a student of Gabriel Bouillon and Jacques Thibault and essentially Karl Flesch. Uh, and he understood how important it is to get a good education. So he started very young to follow his desire to share and to transmit what he himself had uh, benefited from. Uh, he was 20 only when he had his first professorship in Paris. And then later in Mexico City, he reorganized the uh, Mexican Violin School and uh, Geneva, the, uh, university, the conservatory where he uh, gave master classes regularly until the end of his life. This is absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, as much as I know about Henry Schering, some of the facts were new to me. Uh, this, this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, he always uh, fascinated me, well, of course, only through, through his recordings, as in, in the best possible, in the best meaning of the word, as the most organized of artists, in, ter in, in terms of in terms of his musical vision, his understanding of the score, of the structure of the piece, and at the same time never losing the spiritual aspect of what music essentially is, what 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 it does to people. Uh, how do you think this was this was possible? Well, I, I think uh, this was because of his discipline and his unceasing search for perfection. I mean, he wanted to be perfect, but not uh, because he wanted to be perfect. He wanted to be perfect in his interpretation to serve the composer. So he, he was always looking, he put the composer uh, in the front of the stage and he himself was in the back and he was just the humble translator of trying to translate properly so to speak what the composer wanted he also 
was a defender of tolerance, respect, and good manners, and never hesitated to correct openly and directly those who lacked it. That was very fast and very severe. And when he saw that the person in front of him understood, there came a huge smile and mm -hmm. all was in order. So I must say uh, what I experienced in the years I shared with Henrik Schering and how I witnessed his life led me quite naturally to the only thing I wanted to do after his sudden and unduly passing. Continue in the sense he gave to his life, helping and sharing. So the idea of the Henrik Schering Foundation was born I wanted to help young violinists at the beginning of their career. So I parted with the last violin that was left, the Guarnerius de Jesu. And for once, it should not benefit only one person, but several young violinists, future recipients of the Henrik Schering Foundation Award. Created in 1991, the foundation gave its third award to a young Israeli with obvious potential, but who still needed a strong and reassuring hand to lead him his first steps on stage. This hand belonged to a charming and determined young, young lady, great pianist, warm human being. Fortunately for all of us, he never let go of this hand, nor the young lady. That's why we are all today together here and reminiscence of the past that lives on in the presence. Thanks to the two of them, Ang Angela and Vadim, who merged the legacy of Arkady Fomin and Henrik Schering into a work of charity, musical delight, and many prolific human encounters. Thank you very much for this, and thank you for having, letting me be part of it. Mrs. Schering, thank you for being with us, for your absolutely inspiring words. And we shall continue with music, as always. Good idea. Thanks. <laughs>